Hi, everybody. So, this is going to be a little different. I'm not going to be presenting a brand new tool with Uber capabilities and all of that. I'll focus more on building a custom tool. And today, we'll be building a Kubernetes tracer, an ABPF uh, Kubernetes tracer that will watch uh, file access. Basic, but again, the focus is on what it takes to build something. Why do you want to do it? Why? Because, well, at some point, you outgrow the tools you start with. And possibly you need custom business logic. So what are those tools? BPF Trace is probably the number one tool uh, you'll start with. It provides a high level interface to ePPF capabilities. And uh, it's awesome. It allows you to hook into a lot of um, um, uh, different parts of the kernel and uh, the system in general, but its functionality is limited. There's only so many function they provide you. And if you want something more, you need to look elsewhere. So what about uh, Kubernetes? So with Kubernetes, you have kube control trace uh, that pretty much provides an ability to run um, BPF trace on Kubernetes, but actually one of the newer capabilities in kube control trace is an ability to run other things. So in a way, uh, one potential design option is to take kube control trace and create your own tracer and hook it up together. Uh, together. So that, that can be a shortcut if, you're, if uh, you want to go that way. But before we look at the Kubernetes side of things, we'll take a look at the fundamentals and the key eBPF concepts developers would care about. Um, there's a couple of things you'll, you'll want to explore when you're building um, um, an application. First, where do you want to hook in? Uh, you need to decide what part of the system you need to hook in and how. And that's covered by the different program types available in eBPF. Then you also need to figure out the I.O. How are you going to talk to the kernel part of your application? How are you going to provide the config parameters? How are you going to get the data out and all of that? So usually when you build an eBPF-based application, you have a kernel piece and a user piece. And then in the kernel, you have a number of hooks. Uh, uh, and you know, for us, it's going to be tracing hooks. Then you, you're going to have a, a map or a, a set of maps where that you would use for input and output, mostly configuration and basic stats on the way out. And for any kind of dynamic data, you probably want to use perf buffers or ring buffers. And ring buffers are kind of uh, perf buffers plus plus, much nicer, easier to use, uh, single queue, um, and all of that. And then you might also, if, if you're using newer versions, you might also use global variables for basic config parameters. So there are quite a few program types, uh, a lot of different places where you can hook in. And most of the program types, uh, they, they uh, fall into these um, you know, uh, high-level categories. Uh, and uh, the most, uh, the biggest categories are tracing and networking. Um, and today we'll focus on tracing, but there's a lot you can do with networking and lots of great talks about that. So with tracing, you, um, uh, you have a, a choice to make. There are different program types to choose from and uh, they allow you to do static tracing or dynamic tracing. So with static tracing, the nice thing about it, you use stable um, hook points in the system uh, that will not change from one version of the system to another. So that's great. With dynamic tracing, 
uh, you uh, have more flexibility, but it's more brittle. Uh, in the dynamic tracing bucket, you have your uh, K probes and K red probes, or U probes and U red probes, and there you can hook any uh, function you want. Uh, the problem there is that if all of a sudden you know the, the function goes away, uh, you're out of luck. But with the static trace points, there's a well-defined interface that's stable. So if you want uh, a tracing app uh, that's stable and it will run from one version to another, you definitely want to pick um, trace points and do static uh, tracing. Um, and um, um, that's going to simplify um, um, a lot uh, in, in your application. And then with, um, you know, with the uh, trace points, the, there are a few different options. For example, in the kernel, you have uh, trace, uh, trace points and row trace points, and depending on you know, how advanced your application is, you might want to pick raw trace points. It's pretty much trace points, but without uh, um, um, parameter pre-processing. So if you need direct access to data, yeah, yeah, you'll use those. And Tracy, for example, uses a, uses a lot of those. So once you have a general idea of uh, your system architecture, you need to go, uh, well, you need to figure out what components and uh, to use, what kind of code and libraries you'll, you'll want to use. And this is actually one of the biggest challenges you'll have to deal with because there are a lot of different libraries and lots of different languages. And if you're new to eBPF, you're gonna be lost. You know, so many things to choose from, which one do you pick? Uh, and you don't want to invest in one thing and then hit a dead, point, a dead end. With C and C++, the most known library is BCC. So if you're not brand new to uh, eBPF, you know that it's, it's probably the, the biggest um, library out there, with the biggest ecosystem with lots of examples. It's most known for its uh, Python wrapper. So a lot of talks this year, previous years, any talk about eBPF, almost any talk about eBPF, most likely included uh, Python snippets. Uh, the, the main gotcha with uh, BCC and the wrappers around it is that you need to compile uh, the BPF program on the target machine. And Grant talked about that, the, the whole idea behind uh, compile once and run everywhere is, is kind of the solution to the problem with uh, BCC because, you know, when you distribute your application, you don't want to bundle the compiler with it and you don't want to deal with a brittle environment because you don't know what's going on. So with libbpf, you address that problem with, the, with this new concept of uh, compile once run everywhere. It's, it's low level, it provides a lot of nice capabilities, and the, um, the, um, the skeleton it generates is actually super useful. If you, you know, even if you're not a C expert, it makes it easier to work with um, eBPF. eBPF uh, pub is, is a new library. It, it was created for OS query. It's a simple wrapper for libpf um, designed for tracing. Haven't used it much, but it looks interesting. The code is pretty clean. Lots of uh, Go libraries. The first one in the original library is Go BPF from IO uh, Visor. It's, uh, it's a wrapper for BCC, and you get the, the same benefits, most benefits of BCC and the, uh, you know, the, the downsides from it. It's a good option for tracing, uh, and a lot of tracing tools uh, in the cloud native space have been built with this library. There's a library from Cilium. It's a pure library, pure Go library. Um, it's interesting, you know, one of my personal uh, complaints is that it tried to invent its own terminology, collections, specs, like, I don't know. It's, it's confusing. There's enough confusing stuff there, but eBPF 
adding more confusing stuff is going to make things more complicated. But one of the nice features there is the BPF to go uh, module. So it allows you to embed the uh, eBPF program, compiled eBPF program code into your Go code. And it, it provides a nice wrapper to load it and to work with that. And they're also working on the compile once uh, run everywhere support. They, they support a lot of it already. And I've seen samples, uh, but they're almost there. There's a library from Dropbox. It's pretty nice, much nicer than uh, the Cilium library in terms of its structure and how easy it is to understand. Unfortunately, it doesn't support enough program types. So if you want to build a um, um, uh, tracing application using trace points, you're out of luck. There's a library from uh, Aqua, libbpf go, and Tracy is using it. And this is actually one of the libraries uh, we'll be using today. Um, it's nice, it's a thin wrapper. Uh, it exposes a lot of capabilities uh, in terms of what you can attach. I was surprised to see an ability uh, to attach uh, traffic control programs. That's actually not something you get with a lot of libraries. Uh, one thing I wish it had was an ability to auto-attach or default-attach programs. You kind of need to explicitly attach the program that uh, you defined, and we'll see what it looks like in the code. With Python, uh, the, uh, the BCC wrapper is uh, most known uh, to a a anybody uh, out there working with BCC. Nice for prototyping. On your local machine, that's probably the first thing I would do. Uh, easy. Uh, I like Py eBPF because it tried to introduce this idea of Python only uh, BPF experience where you don't need to write C code. Uh, it needs more attention, uh, and it needs updates. With Rust, there are quite a few libraries. There's a, um, a lightweight wrapper. Uh, libbpf rs it's pretty much the official wrapper if you look at the um, uh, the libbpf bootstrap repo you'll see rust examples and i think that's the library they use there red bpf was one of the original uh, libbpf wrappers it has a number of other capabilities and uh, the most exciting rust library is aya and the author of Aya, at least one of the primary authors, uh, used to um, work on Red BPF as well. It's pure, uh, it's pure Rust, including the uh, BPF program code. So it means that you don't need to write any C code, and if you're a, a Rust person, it's, it's super cool. It's still a little early. The tooling ecosystem looks promising. Um, yeah, a little tough. I have a few samples to show there. There are a few other uh, libraries, but they're mostly BCC wrappers. The Lua wrapper is the official wrapper. Now that we looked at a few fundamentals and the libraries, uh, we can um, um, we can t take a look at the Kubernetes side of things. And the first thing uh, you probably want to uh, figure out is the uh, kube control plugin. So uh, for the Kubernetes side of things, you'll need to have two parts. The, uh, the plugin, technically, you can work around it with, um, and just use kube control and, and manually set up resources. But it's nice. That's what um, kube control trace does. And then you also need to figure out uh, the, uh, the, the, the part that you run in the cluster. So with, uh, with the kube control plugins, Technically, you don't need any libraries. Uh, you don't actually need any programming language to create a uh, plugin. You can create a simple shell script, put it in one of the uh, bin folders, and it will be picked up. As long as it starts with kubectl dash and your uh, plugin name, it will be picked up. And you can use libraries if you want to. There's a, there's a, nice helper library for Go, CLI runtime. That's what uh, uh, kube control uses. 
you know, internally, I think it was extracted from it. I, I didn't find it super useful um, because I, I, I don't use Cobra for the CLI options and a lot of the cap, you know, uh, helpers are around that. But the client configuration helpers, uh, they're actually nice. And then, but the cube control plugin, you also need to figure out how you'll interact with the um, uh, with Kubernetes, what client library you, you'll want to use. And technically, the, uh, the language you use for the kube control plugin and the language you use for the um, tracing engine, they don't need to be the same. So they can, you know, the, the kube control um, plugin could, could be Go, uh, the, the engine could be C, uh, but there are a few options. There's obviously the official client Go library and there's a, an official uh, Python library. It has a lot of examples, uh, pretty nice. There is an, un, an unofficial Rust library, kubrs, also nice. Probably has the most examples I've seen. Uh, today, I'm not gonna show examples uh, in each language, possible language, but uh, it's. It's nice to know that there are options. There are uh, a number of options for other languages, but uh, yeah, uh, feel free to explore. I, I, I'd stick with those three. So once you figure out how you're gonna build your kube control plugin and how you're gonna talk to the Kubernetes cluster, uh, you'll need to figure out how you'll run the uh, tracer application in, 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 in Kubernetes. There are a few options. Uh, the two major options are using jobs and daemon sets. Uh, jobs is what kube control trace uses. So when you want to run uh, kube control trace, when you type kube, kube control trace uh, run something, 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 uh, um, the, uh, the kube control plugin will, um, will schedule a job on demand and it'll uh, figure out where to run it and, and then uh, the, uh, the BPF tracer or the other tracer will run on the selected uh, nodes where the job is running. So when, but when you're using jobs, you need to figure out how to, uh, where to run uh, the jobs because if you need to create an application in a certain pod, you need to make sure that the job runs there. There are a few options uh, available there. The most basic one is to set the node name in the pod spec, but it's brittle and it's not recommended. The next best option is to use node selectors, and that's pretty much the most basic option that's, uh, uh, that you can use. Uh, if you don't need any kind of fancy way to select the nodes where you want to uh, run the job, that's that would be the way to do it. And the last one, uh, the last option is to use node affinity. Uh, but node affinity, it provides more advanced um, node selection capabilities. Um, and this is, I think that that's what uh, Cube Control Trace uses internally, um, node affinity. The other option to use is daemon sets. And it's actually uh, the option that a number of other tools use. Um, the the trade-off there is that with with jobs you get uh, tracing on demand. So if something happens and then you decide to run kube control trace, um, and it's nice on one hand. On the other hand, it's um, you know it, it it might have gaps because by the time something happens and you run kube control trace with a job. Uh, what you need is already gone. For example, if you need to trace how an application binds to a port, using a job isn't really a good design there because by the time you decide that, hey, I want to run uh, kube control trace, uh, the application already called the bind call and, and all of that. So that's when daemon sets are nice. Uh, Kubernetes takes care of running your pod on every machine. Uh, the only gotcha there is that it's on you uh, to figure out, to keep track of the containers that you want to uh, uh, track. And tools like Inspector Gadget have a number of tricks uh, to detect that. For example, uh, with Cryo, they use pre-start hooks. So 
uh, they get notified when um, a container is created, but it's not running, and then they can uh, configure the, their gadgets, their tracers, to trace the application before it even starts. So we have a few minutes left, and I figured it's a good opportunity to take a look at the code. So this is the, yeah, I'm going to make it a little bigger. This is the cube control plugin for the sample application. And it's using Go, and like I said, it doesn't need to be um, Go. It doesn't even need to be uh, uh, in a real programming language. But here, uh, it, it has this install command, and the install command connects to Kubernetes, and then it launches uh, a daemon set. And most of the time, and a lot of samples I've seen, that they, they use kube control and they use YAML and all of that. So I figured it would be a nice example to show how to create a daemon set programmatically. Uh, it's pretty much the same things uh, you'll, you'll do uh, either way. The, there's a couple of things you'll, you need to make sure you set. One of them is uh, privileged uh, mode because you, you're going to have a, um, a tracer. It needs low-level access. And then you might need to mount certain host file, syst uh, file system paths. So with this sensor, I have a couple of um, right now it, it's configured to use the C sensor and I'll, I'll have a little demo in a few minutes. So yeah, one, let's see. So here's an example of kubectl. This is actually um, this is actually a shell script. So if I run cube ctl file mon, and that's the name of um, that's the name of the plugin I created, and it ends up being in one of the uh, path directories. So if I run cube ctl file mon um, install it's going to install the um, uh, the application on Kubernetes. Get, and then I have a daemon set right there. And if I look at the pods, I see that I have a pod. And if I look at the logs, this is what the sensor is doing. It's, a, it's the C sensor, and it just shows me what different um, applications um, are accessing. And then, so let's, let's take a look at the 
application. So this is the Go application, the Go sensor that gets scheduled in the daemon set. And so that's the main code there. When you, when you start it, you create a file monitor and then And when you initialize it, you're going to load the embedded, and in this case, it's embedding the um, BPF bytecode using the new embedding feature in Go. And then Then it loads the BPF module and then attaches the trace points. So this is what I was referring to. Uh, you have to, for each trace point you have, uh, you need to call attach trace, po a trace point explicitly. Uh, with the uh, um, libbpf library, there's um, a single call that you can uh, make to attach everything. So it would be nice to do that. So once you attach everything, it, it sets up perf buffers to get the, the events from the uh, kernel component. And then in the run loop, it consumes events from the raw event channel. And this is the channel that was passed to the uh, perf buffer uh, setup call. And that's one of the nice things in, in the libbpf go uh, library. It provides a, a go abstraction to interact uh, with, um, with the low level primitives. And the data that you get, you need to decode it. So the program itself, so the other side, Okay, uh, this is the map where, uh, that, that we use for internal storage, and I'll get to it later, and that's the events um, perf buffer that we use to pass data to the user space. So the trace points we have is the syscenter open trace point, and the sys um, exit open trace point and uh, sys enter open at trace point and sys exit open at trace point. Pretty much we hook the, uh, the entry and the exit uh, to the file operations so we can get the status codes on the way out and get more information. And this is what the map is used for. It's used for temporary storage. So when we see the entry uh, trace point, we save the data into a structure. For example, here we create this info. Info structure, we save the, the process ID, the thread ID, uh, flags, the file name. Uh, and then we save it in the map and on the way out we look up that record and then we add stuff to it. Uh, for example, we add the user ID and then we also get the process name and then you, you can also get the actual file name and all of that, but that's meant to be pretty straightforward. And the C version uh, the C version is pretty similar. So there is also there is also a temporary map. Uh, there is a, a ring buffer, and that that's the nicer version of the uh, perf buffer. And the the code inside looks almost identical. The user side of it 
looks different and here's here's the call that I like the most so you open the BPF program uh, the BPF module then you load the module and everything in it, uh, the programs and the maps and all of that. And then there's a single call to attach everything. And and there, uh, internally, libbpf uses these uh, section definitions internally uh, to do the auto-attaching magic. I know we're out of time, so. Thank you.